Episode 3 of the Cinema Podcast is brought to you in 3D. Uh, This is the last of the Jaws kind of themed cinema pieces. Jaws is a reoccurring theme here because Jaws the Revenge is the reason why I started the cinema blog and subsequently the cinema podcast. And if you haven't tuned into the two previous episodes, uh, Jaws the Revenge I consider to be the worst motion picture of all time and the true definition of cinema. Now Jaws 3D seems like it's an easy target and, and on Twitter a lot of people have said no way. Jaws 3D is far worse than Jaws the Revenge. I think there's an odd mix here with Jaws 3D. I, I, yes, it was done by Universal Studios. Yes, Carl Gottlieb came back and has his name on, on the screenplay. And a lot of the people affiliated with the first Jaws and, and even Jaws 2 do have their names on this. And, and the number one person, of course, is Joe Alves, who was uh, the production designer for the first two Jaws films and a number of movies. Uh, he got the chance to direct Jaws 3D and, and we kind of all know where that went. I don't think Joe Alves had the intent to set out to make a bad movie, unlike the filmmakers of Jaws the Revenge. Let's go back to the summer of 1982. I went to go see with a bunch of friends uh, an airplane spoof type of thing on soap operas called Young Doctors in Love. And the trailer, the big trailer, on the front of that movie was for Jaws 3. And there was one catch to it that even as a young kid, I think I was in like 10th grade at that time, I was like, "Uh uh-oh, because it was in 3D. And if you remember that trailer, I I mean, for copyright reasons, I I can't put it on here, but the trailer was, it was a black screen and then you saw a Roman numeral one and then there was another Roman numeral one and then there was a third and the shark fin comes rushing at you and turns to the left at the last minute and the big thing, Jaws 3D, comes up and the third dimension is terror. And as excited as I was for a Jaws 3, there was that uh uh-oh moment. I love Jaws and Jaws 2 so much that when I got into sixth grade, I wrote Jaws 3, handwritten in like a Mead spiral notebook. It was like 200 pages of handwritten novel. And I brought back Chief Brody, and of course the setting is Amity, and and I was in sixth grade, so what do you want? But that's how much I love Jaws. And I could not wait for a Jaws 3. And, and even in 6th grade, I'm like, oh, my, my book is going to get published and they're going to turn it into the third Jaws film. And, and of course, again, I was in 6th grade. But that shows you how much I really loved it. So to hear that there was going to be a Jaws 3 and then confirm that there was going to be a Jaws 3, but punctuated by the fact that it was in 3D, which was the new resurrected craze at the time, I can't really say that that excited me too much. Now, I did have some other hope. The summer of 1983 also gave us Psycho 2, and I went to go see Psycho 2, which will be a separate cinema podcast. I went to go see that, expecting the absolute worst, and ended up walking out absolutely loving the film so much. I called my parents at the payphone in the mall outside the theater, went back, bought a ticket, and went back in to see another show of Psycho 2. I thought, well, maybe this will be the same thing here. Now, the summer of 1983 also gave us Return of the Jedi. And that was kind of an interesting uh uh-oh moment, too, because I stood in line for, for Return of the Jedi for almost seven hours. And it was a great interactive experience in watching the film, but there was an uh uh-oh moment there, the Ewoks. So I was starting to to kind of come into my own as, as a movie watcher, uh, not just, you know, a wannabe filmmaker one day, but but for someone who watch movies to go, yeah, I'm dazzled by all of this marketing, but there are certain things in here that give me pause. So I was hoping none of that would follow me to, to Jaws 3. I was working at McDonald's in the summer of 1983, and I absolutely hated that job. And I remember Jaws 3 was going to open, and I wanted to be there opening night. I used to bicycle five miles one way, not in snow, uphill, but I used to bicycle five miles one way to from home to work at McDonald's. And I switched shifts with this guy named Scott. And and he said, why do you have a date? And I kind of said, no, even though I I was dating a girl, she really didn't want to see Jaws 3. But anyway, he switched with me 
and I got up there. Now, what McDonald's didn't know is that I was also applying for a job at the movie theater. I really wanted to get into the movie theater so badly to work as an usher. And uh, the assistant manager up there remembered me putting in my application and such. And uh, they let me in free that night. I remember getting up to the box office and they just waved me in like, no, no. In other words, I kind of thought, wow, I, I actually might be getting a job here. They're, they're kind of hooking me up already. I, I guess the point is, is that films are to entertain and, and make us excited and, and thrilled. And, and that was the fun of being a kid, of, of knowing that some big movie or, or another installment of, of a movie that you love so much was coming out. And, and I hope people listening can go, yeah, man, I I totally relate to what you're talking about, which is why it was so soul crushing to see Jaws 3 in the theaters and go, ah, oh, come on. Uh, again, Jaws 2 was an extremely well-made sequel. You don't have to like it. A lot of people don't, but a lot of people do. And I think it's pretty easy to say uh, that Jaws 2 is the best of, of all the sequels. And, and that's really not saying much, especially with Jaws the Revenge in the running. But the film was already starting to be planned even before Jaws 2 was released. So they were thinking about what they were going to do, and, and, and this thing got, you know, bandied back and forth, and there was talk that Verna Fields might end up directing it, and, and they, they had all these people attached, and then, you know, was Roy Scheider going to come back, and Roy Scheider definitely did not want to return. And then there was the idea to do a Jaws 3 kind of spoof film, a comedy. And Maddie Simmons and John Hughes were going to be involved, uh, you know, of, of course, involved with the vacation movie at, at that time. And Joe Dante of, of Piranha fame, uh, the Spielberg's favorite Jaws ripoff, was, was going to direct. And it was going to be called Jaws 3 People Zero. And I guess at that time, Richard Zanuck and David Brown, the original producers of both Jaws and Jaws 2, were, were still attached or at least probably had some kind of right of first refusal uh, they they were brought this concept and, and David Brown uh, turned it down. And David Brown said, you know, it, it would have been like fouling your own nest. In other words, look, we had a good thing here with Jaws and Jaws 2. To go and make a spoof is, is just really kind of giving a middle finger to all the fans. In hindsight, they kind of spoofed it anyway with, with Jaws 3 because Jaws 3 is actually a, a very funny movie. Verna Fields was involved. Now, as you remember, she was the Oscar winning editor of Jaws. And then she became, a, I believe, a vice president over at Universal. And she contacted Joe Alves, the, the production designer from the first two films. And she said, listen, they're making a Jaws 3 and, and they're kind of really screwing this up. And uh, Zanuck and Brown don't want anything to do with this. And she said to Alves, you know, probably because of his pedigree of being involved with the first two films. And from what I understand, he's a hell of a nice guy. She said, you really should try to get involved. And, and they're, they've shopped out the film to this other production company. The rights were sold off to Alan Landsberg and Alan Landsberg Productions. Jaws 3D walks a fine line between cinema and, and all out Ed Wood filmmaking. Jaws 3D is actually mystery science theater cheesy kind of fun. Jaws the Revenge, there is no fun to that. It's just a cynical piece of product. Jaws 3D kind of keeps a foot or fin, if you will, in, in both worlds. And, and Alves revealed how a 3D concept came around. I mean, Alves said he was, he was at a, a park in Florida and he saw some 3D underwater photography exhibit and he loved it. And he said it was bothering him that they were making a Jaws 3 and there weren't really a lot of threes out there at the time. And, and again, you know, when a franchise hits that third one, a lot of people say it's the curse of the threes. There was Rocky 3 at the time and Alv said that he was just mulling things around and he said Jaws 3D and I guess boom, uh, an idea was born. Somehow along the line, they got I Am Legend author Richard Matheson involved. And he wrote some kind of story uh, that was kind of, I guess, based along the line of the Matawan shark attacks from 1916. It would take place in the present day. The studio got involved and an executive started mucking around with Richard Matheson's script. And, and look, we all know how great of a writer Richard Matheson was. And he said that, oh, they, they made me rewrite this and do that. And they made me write a part for Mickey Rooney of all people. And Mickey Rooney was going to be in this movie and then he ended up not taking the role. So that was all useless. And it just became a mess. 
And Matheson was not a supporter of, of the 3D thing at all. And, and afterwards, I guess he had seen the film and he actually lobbied to get his name removed from the Jaws 3 script, but they kept his name on there. And believe it or not, I, I mean, I guess I know why that was a cynical move because when I saw that Richard Matheson had contributed to the screenplay, he was one of the writers. I'm like, well, this has got to be great. I mean, how could it be bad coming from Richard Matheson? I didn't know then how Hollywood really worked. So just because somebody's name is on something doesn't mean they had an active part in the project. Matheson's opinion of, of the 3D was, was a, a thumbs down. He said it, it absolutely had no effect whatsoever. He felt the 3D was a waste of time. I don't believe Joe Alves set out to make a bad movie. I really don't. I think he had all the best intentions from, from all accounts. I mean, everything that we've seen, look, from Escape from New York and Jaws and Jaws 2, he's an excellent production designer. Jaws 3D was made to squeeze a few more bucks out of a film series that was never intended to be a franchise. Spielberg said that from the very beginning. Jaws is a standalone film. It doesn't need a sequel. And when they did ask him to come back for Jaws 2, he briefly entertained it. But he, I guess in a weekend, from what I understand, he wrote a script for Jaws 2 that was based on Quint's story of the USS Indianapolis. But Spielberg said to bring this back to Amity, include the Brodies again, that's just silliness. And look, I got to admit, when, when the first poster art came out, it was this poster of, of the same shark from the first film, uh, superimposed looming over SeaWorld uh, with some water skiers in the front and a giant fin. But the thing that concerned me was the all new, all new. It was printed on the left and right flanking the shark, all new, like some carnival poster or something like that. And it evoked the memories of Halloween 3. And we'll talk about that in a separate podcast. So now look, there there were a lot of uh-oh moments in Jaws 3. My opening night fears as I walked into that theater, sat down with a popcorn and a group of friends, and I had one friend that goes, I'm telling you, this is going to suck. And I'm like, no, 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 it looks like it's actually going to be pretty good. Let's, let's find out. And heck, it was going to be 3D, so how bad could it be? So while the first film opened with the iconic attack on the Skinny Dipper, okay, Chrissy Watkins, and then the sequel opened up, Jaws 2 opened up with the two divers being eaten outside the wreck of the orca. Jaws 3D gave us a large grouper fish bit in half with its mouth still moving, floating out into the audience with the magic of 3D. On top of it, the Jaws 3 titles come zooming up out of the bottom of the screen and chomp together like a shark mouth. Folks, we were only... 30 seconds into the movie and my friend looked over at me with the told you so look. So I want to look at some good things real quickly here to show how this offsets cinema because there were some good things in here that you're like, wow, this, this actually may be a good movie. And, and the standout was Louis Gossett Jr. He just won the previous year, the Oscar for an officer and a gentleman. Why would he turn around and do a bad movie? That was a sign of faith for me that the film was going to be good. In addition to that, it really had a good cast. I mean, Dennis Quaid, Bess Armstrong. A lot of people give Bess Armstrong a lot of grief. I thought she was really game for this. She looked like she was giving it all in that movie. You have Louis Gossett Jr. You had Simon McCorkendale. And look, this was Leah Thompson's first film. I mean, it was a really likable cast. It was a shame that they didn't do anything with these people. I mean, Louis Gossett Jr. wouldn't win an Oscar and turn around and do a crappy shark movie. Oh, wait, we should probably ask Michael Caine about that. Look, as a kid, this next point, it seemed exciting, but it definitely files under the just because you can doesn't mean you should category. And that is, they brought the Brodies back. Now, Roy Scheider is not returning. Lorraine Gary had retired. Um, they're, they're not doing anything else with the adult characters. And since this is taking place in Florida, somebody thought it was a good idea to shoehorn in Mike and Sean Brody. On the flip side, they cast two really good actors in these roles, John Putch and Dennis Quaid. They have a good chemistry together. I mean, I'm going to tell you that there is a kitchen breakfast scene between Putch and Quaid and Armstrong that hints at a better movie that could have been. It really does. Their, their chemistry is good together. They're, they're kind of just like running off of each other. And they're very likable people. They have true chemistry. Ultimately, 
these three actors were were wasted in a really really bad script and story. Uh, even Richard Matheson said he he kind of like threw his hands in the air when the studio came to him and said and and you're gonna put the Brodies back into this. You're gonna figure the two boys in and Matheson was just like you you've got to be kidding. So that was also, even though as a kid, I was like, wow, Mike and Sean are returning. And then I was getting older at that point. I'm thinking, well, that's really kind of silly. How do these guys keep coming across these great white sharks? And then, of course, you've got the really big issue, and that is it takes place at SeaWorld. And SeaWorld is landlocked. So do we just kind of throw that all to the side and SeaWorld now borders the ocean? So aside from the fact that SeaWorld is landlocked, the, the audience is again expected to believe that the Brody family has yet another shark problem with a great white shark. <laughs> they were actually considering using the same shark from Jaws 2, the one that was electrocuted after biting the cable, and making it the same shark that somehow finds its way to SeaWorld and into the Brody's lives once again. And I remember reading a Fangoria article where Joe Alves said something along the line of, well, we, we chose not to go with that because we would have been laughed off the screen. But you, you kind of were anyway. There, there's a great story about Dennis Quaid where I think he said he was shopping in New York City and this woman came up to him and said, hey, you're the guy in Jaws 3. And, and I guess he said, yeah, yeah, I am. And she said, I got a question for you. Why do they make shit like that? And according to Quaid, um, he said that question so threw him, he actually quit acting for, I think, like a year and went to kind of go find himself and, and kind of reevaluate his whole life and, and acting career because of that, that question that woman posed to him. And once when he was being interviewed by ESPN for something, uh, they were like, it was called the, I think the article was called 10 Burning Questions for Dennis Quaid. Uh, they asked him, which which is your worst movie? And, and he said, Jaws 3. When asked why, Quaid said, well, it's, it's Jaws, Sharks in 3D, but it's my son's favorite. He hauls it out about every month or so. And then when he was asked if he watches the movie with his son, he just simply and succinctly said, no. Jaws 3D boasts the biggest shark in the series. I guess this mama shark is 35 feet. And where Jaws the Revenge will run with it, this shark in Jaws 3D, it growls and it snarls. It can also swim in reverse, and so can the baby. One of the most ridiculous effect scenes in this film, and notice I don't say the worst, is because we'll save that one for last. But one of the most ridiculous scenes is when Simon McCorkendale uh, is trying to lure the shark into a filtration pump. It's in a tunnel. Uh, his rope conveniently breaks, and somehow this shark that's moving a mile every five weeks is able to get a hold of him and totally ingest him. I mean, the shark, instead of ripping him to pieces, is like a whale and it just sucks him in. And we get a shot from inside the shark of Simon McCorkendale being chewed up. And, and not even being chewed, he's just being forced down the gullet of this fish. And it's a really bad scene. And I remember people laughing like hell in the movie theater. And that's when I was sitting in this movie... Not only was my friend right, but I'm, I'm actually getting angry watching it going. It's it's like they really just didn't care. I, I can't believe that we went from Jaws to Jaws 2 to this. Now, to be fair, and I started this out by saying, look, I'm, I'm going to give Jaws 3D a bit of a break on the cinema label. There was a lot of bad luck with this film. The film's effects were shopped out to a lower quality effects company. There are several blue screen matte effects that were left in the film unfinished or or unrefined. And I gotta stop here to say that the plot line and even the effects remind me of, of Ultraman. Ultraman was this Japanese action science fiction series really for kids. I loved it growing up. I watched every episode and I have them on DVD. And it's basically about a an alien superhero guy that comes down and fights gigantic Godzilla-like monsters to save Japan. There is an episode in Ultraman, I think it's called the Undersea Science Laboratory or Science Center, and there's this monster, it looks like a, a monstrous narwhal, and it's attacking everybody who have been trapped in this Undersea Science Center. It's almost the plot of Jaws 3, and when I was watching Jaws 3 in theaters, I'm thinking, oh my god, I, I saw this on Ultraman. There are scenes in this where people are running through these connecting tubes in Jaws 3D 
and it's clearly blue screen. There, there's nothing matted into the background. And in one of these tunnel scenes, a little girl goes, Daddy, look. And he looks up and he goes, oh, holy shit. And yet we don't see anything. What are they pointing at? What are they looking at? And that's because the effects just weren't finished. The film had to go to print before the effects were finished. And that's the studio's fault. That's not Joe Alves' fault. I'm sure he was mortified by that. The film just gave up trying. And that, folks, is cinema. Look, Ed Wood used toys, styrofoam plates, and hubcaps for his alien spaceships, but he was trying his best, man. He wasn't trying to screw anybody. He wasn't trying to cut corners. His effects shop may have been his living room, and he may have only had a budget of a few hundred bucks, but the effects budget on Jaws 3D was over 10 million. There's no excuse other than we just don't care. Where's that shark roar? <laughs> Joe Alves is on record saying we tried very hard to make it a people picture. And you know what? I believe him. But one of the worst visual effects shots, and it's at the end, ever put to screen in a big budget movie, is saved, as I said, for last. And that's where the shark attacks the control center at the end. I, I challenge any of you, just go on YouTube. I have stills of it on my blog, on my cinema blog. Those are the real effects. It looks like they went into a SeaWorld souvenir shop bought some $10 rubber shark toy, like maybe a 12 inch toy, and they just dangled that in front of a screen. And then it comes up and it shatters the glass and, and it's not even moving. And the glass shatters, maybe they were trying for some stylistic surrealistic effect, but it, none of it works. And then you're subjected to this rubber foam toy shark stuck in, in the window bay area and it's trying to pull out and, and it just looks horrible. I mean, it was laughable and I'm sitting in the theater going, I can't believe I'm watching this. David Hogan, uh, a special effects expert on Jaws 3D said, Alan Landsberg pulled the plug on electronic compositing the very day that shot was scheduled to be completed. When that scene was shot, it was done with a combination of a rear lit screen and front lit cloth. We told them at the time that it would be a real bitch to pull a film optical because the level of green are different. That's why you have such a mess at the end of this movie between the green screen and the matting and that awful rubber shark coming up to the window. It's just terrible. But then just when you think it can't get any worse, the shark is killed by a yellow grenade still in the hand of a dead Simon McCorkendale. Because again, sharks, I guess, swallow their prey whole and somehow this shark can function, swing around with a huge hunk of meat in the form of Simon McCorkendale stuck in its throat while it's wedged in that control room tower. And the open space around that fish shows it could pull free at any time. If it was able to reverse out of a giant filtration pipe, why is a broken window giving this four ton, 35 foot mother trouble? The movie ends, nobody applauds. It isn't like Jaws, it isn't even like Jaws 2. No one's applauding. But there was this kid ahead of me around the same age, maybe a little older than me. And he turned around, I guess, to his dad or somebody. And he said, yeah, you know, that that was pretty good. I, I don't think it was that bad at all. And I wanted to be like, reach out and grab this kid and shake him and go, did you just watch the same movie I did? I saw this movie for free and I want my money back. If this film had been anything but a Jaws movie, it could be accepted, like a, a Roger Corman cheesy B-movie fun fest, a shark run amok knockoff, or, or a bad monster from the sea ripoff, like Up From the Depths, if you remember that. My God, I used to watch that every time it came on HBO, especially at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. Here is another aspect of cinema that I call the hit and run. And that is when you know you have a really bad movie, you know that that audiences are not going to respond well to this, but there is a chance to make your money off of it before anybody knows how bad it is. You throw it out at a certain time in the box office scheduling, knowing that people will rush out to see it. And by the time bad word of mouth gets around, you yank it. They did something very similar to this. Columbia Pictures did this with John Belushi's last film called Neighbors. They knew they had a troubled film, and, the, and the, the, the history of that film, you can go and research that all on your own. But they had a troubled movie, and they knew it. It was an uneven film, and, and they really suspected they had a bomb on their hands. So they selected a time over the Christmas holiday to release this, just as people would come see it. And over this holiday, everybody's distracted by the holidays and such. They'll pour into the movie to see it. It will make its money, fingers crossed, 
and then they're going to pull it before the really bad word of mouth gets around. The movie is a mixed bag, and whether you liked it or not, the fact is it was a financial success. It was not a bomb, and that was because of the hit-and-run strategy. They did the same thing with Jaws 3D. While Jaws and Jaws 2 were released in early June, end of May, Jaws, I believe, was end of May, again, first week of June, same with Jaws 2. Jaws 2 was like second week of June. In other words, you have the entire summer for this movie to run, and that is the intent. They're going to run this thing all through the summer. Not Jaws 3. They threw it out right at the end of July, going into August. They knew they had about a two-week window before the really bad reviews and the bad word of mouth by people gets around, and then they're going to yank it. So people poured in to see this film because it's Jaws, and here it is. The movie made a profit. This movie was making money. Jaws 3D was making money even when they pulled it. I think it was like the number five film, somewhere there, it doesn't matter, but it was in the top 10 of money-making movies and they yanked it and that tells you why. They yanked it because they knew that that run wasn't going to keep going so long and it's better to yank it now while the press is saying that it's in the top 10 rather than saying this movie really sucks and when those bad reviews start hitting the paper. Remember, this is before the internet. So it's before a movie could be damaged within 24 to 48 hours of its release. This was called the hit and run strategy and that folks, is cinema. Look, I'll give you a quote right from the Gambler's Handbook. The hit and run strategy is more a general approach to a gambling session than a system for a specific casino game. As the name suggests, the hit and run strategy is more a guerrilla style attack on the casino. In its simplest form, you take a short term approach to your gambling and lock in any short term for profits by leaving when you are up. There's the key by leaving when you are up. The worst effect from cinema is the conditioning of the audience to lose the ability to differentiate between bad filmmaking and cynical filmmaking. In fact, they soon lose the ability to recognize great filmmaking. Cinema numbs us into acceptance of whatever we are told is good. Folks, we need to demand better. We need to understand that sometimes it isn't it's so bad it's good. It's just plain bad. That's it for the Jaws stuff. We're done. I've made my point. Jaws the Revenge is cinema. I'm going to say it's 50-50 with Jaws 3D because I don't believe Joe Alves had the intention to make a bad movie. Thanks for listening. Hope you enjoyed it. And I look forward to our next podcast. Keep in mind, demand better. Head on over to iTunes and give me a like and review. And if you want to read my cinema blog, You'll find it at horrorfuel.com forward slash author forward slash Harrison. If you like this podcast and if you're an aspiring filmmaker making your way through the independent film minefield, I offer one-on-one coaching sessions by phone or Skype. Email me at this site or classof85llc at gmail.com for information and pricing. I offer input on your completed or in-development film or screenplay and offer insight into all aspects of pre-production, production, and post, and eventual distribution. Hope to hear from you.